Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. My guest today is Roger Payne. He's part of the, uh, he's the founder and the president of Ocean Alliance. Uh, we're going to talk about humpback whales and their songs and, uh, and his work. So, Roger, thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. So I guess from your bio, it looks like you've, you've been interested in whales for most of your life. Um, can you tell me a little bit, a little bit about how you, uh, came to experience whales and why you study them? Great. Well, I had actually started by working on bats with the man who discovered echolocation, Don Griffin, when I was an undergraduate in college. And I went from there in my PhD years as to studying how I demonstrated that owls can locate prey and total darkness based only on hearing it and they have a lot of groovy adaptations which improve their opportunities of getting more than one claw into a mouse and then I went for a postdoc and worked on how moths hear bats coming and choose the appropriate maneuver as to whether to turn away or dive into the ground or just drop to the ground and that in other words and they do that with ears that have three cells in each ear three sense cells and so it's just shocking that they're able to do it but after yeah. that had gone on it was i was a long way past my phd about six years past it and i thought to myself i'm just entertaining myself it's the world is full, going to hell in a hack and it's time to do something to try it that is relevant to that problem and so I thought well if the only thing you know anything about is enough to talk about it with any kind of authority is the sounds that animals make and hear then in fact the you've got to find some animal which is threatened which has that problem and then I thought of whales but I knew absolutely nothing about whales I'd seen never seen a whale I'd seen a distant spout when crossing the Atlantic by boat one time but I hadn't seen anything else and but as soon as I made that decision I was I talked to the my then bosses who were at the then New York Zoological Society now the Wildlife Conservation Society and I everybody was very welcoming of the idea and I was Working there only 49%, 51% of my salary came from Rockefeller University, where I then stayed for another 18 years. And that's where I began working. And of course, studying whales at Rockefeller University, which is famous for things like, you know, the, the intimate details, molecular details of the insides of cells and that sort of thing. Wonderful work. Uh, working on whale songs was fairly odd but they put up with it and that was exciting so all right you've been studying whales for a very long time what were your did you have like preconceived notions or goals of what you wanted to understand or did you just observe them and whatever you learned you learned 
it was uh, not either quite not quite either one of those. It was instead the idea that it was at the time clear that people were killing about thirty three thousand large whales, baleen whales, a year, far more dolphins than that, but baleen whales. And what I wanted to do was to find something. I felt the reason that nothing was happening, that this was being allowed, is that nobody knew things that were interesting and curious about whales. And so that's what I set out to try to find, is something that I felt would capture the imagination of whales. And everything beyond that was just pure luck. I happened to meet an interesting engineer who was working for the U.S. Navy on secret things. I've never known quite what he was doing, but he had been making recordings of whales. He had a wire that came into his office in Bermuda all the way from 30 miles offshore where there were whales. And he recorded whenever he heard interesting sounds. And he wasn't sure it was whales, but he guessed correctly that it was. His name was Frank Watlington, and he was a wonderfully generous guy. And he, I, when I heard these sounds, I was, I was listening to them under the worst possible conditions in the engine room of a boat with a generator roaring so loud you had to shout to be heard over it. And uh, he threaded a tape that he took from his pocket over the heads of a tape recorder and put some headphones on, adjusted the gains, then handed the headphones to me and shouting, he said, basically, um, you know, I think these are humpback whale songs. And the reason he thought they were hump whales was because they were loud and very low in frequency and humpback whales, because it was at that time of year that they saw quite a lot of humpbacks passing Bermuda. And we later showed he was right. And I asked him for a copy of the sounds and took them back to Rockefeller University and played them over and over and over again. And when you do that with something, you eventually learn it, whether you intended to or not. And that's when I realized, my God, these things are repeating themselves and they're doing so in a rhythmic fashion. And when something repeats itself rhythmically, you say that it's singing, whether it's a cricket or a frog or a bird or a whale. And so that was the beginning of that. We published that in Science. The world took interest. I then put out a recording of whales on a, or a LP, a, a 33 and a third record. And that actually sold, became the most popular recording in of natural history recording ever. I think it still is to this day. And then the National Geographic picked it up and they put a flexible record, what they used to call Evatone records, in the issue of their magazine one month. And that record, in order, they had at the time 10 and a half million members. And in order to give a record to every member, they had to print 10 and a half min, million records, which means that somebody from the geographic called up the Evatone record company and said, We want 10 and a half million records of this tape we're sending you. And that became and remains, by the way, to this very day, the largest single print order in the history of the recording industry of anything. Okay, of so course. so with the with the whales, do only humpbacks sing, or do all whales sing, or did you well, just they, focus they, on humpbacks? They all make sounds which are repeated at some uh, time of year, or sometimes a lot during the year, and these, and because they're repeated and they're rhythmic in nature, you can say. The proper term to describe them is that the, it's songs that they're singing, um, just as you say, as I pointed out, a cricket sings or a frog sings. What you mean is it repeats itself rhythmically. That's all that's claiming. It's not saying beyond that that they have the same notions going through their minds about the power of song. But my suspect, right. suspicion is their notions may be rather better than ours as to the power of song. So can scientists tell, can they understand the language that the whales are using yet? I mean, I know they've characterized, you know, screeches and whistles and clickings and things like that. But how far has the characterization gone? It hasn't gone far enough, I think. And I'm actually involved with a group called CETI, C-E-T-I, which is uh, attempting to translate whale speak from sperm whales. And sperm whales have a click. Uh, you know, their communication is in clicks. And these clicks are at times formed into what are, are known as codas, 
but what they really are is a little pattern of clicks which is repeated. Okay, that's a song by definition. And those the clicks, I suspect, and a lot of others who know have, have been studying it as well, suspect that the patterns of those clicks are in fact uh, conveying information which would be a form of communication. In other words, different things at different times. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Is anyone able to tell, are any parts of the song obvious in what they mean, or is the whole thing a mystery, and has any insight been gotten into what they're trying to communicate? A very general statement can be made about, you know, the, the let me start with humpbacks, about some of the sounds are made by whales when they are joining a group of whales. Well, you're not sure whether that's a threat or an announcement of participation or a greeting or what it is, but you can rely on the fact that it will appear as a whale is doing such a joining. And there are uh, uh, sounds which are obvious threats, which take place during physical fights of some kind or another. And that would be in the baleen whales, like the humpback whales, for example. But in the case of something like sperm whales, you know that they also, a lot of their clicks are, they fit the picture perfectly of sounds which would be used for echolocation and gaining more and more information faster and faster the closer you get to the your target, your prey, the thing you're after. And uh, so that is pretty, that sort of sound is pretty well understood, but, or at least it's well enough understood to know its function. But in terms of specific greeting sounds, they very often make sounds sperm whales do just as they leave the surface, as they peak their flukes and drop and start going down in the ocean. And that those sounds are very intriguing to us. We're having great hopes that that will be, it will be possible to say something about the meanings of those sounds. Do whales communicate differently when they're close to each other? Let's say a mother and a baby or like a, a pod of whales versus uh, being, you know, miles apart. I, they certainly do. When they're communicating over long distances, or sorry, short distances, let me start with like a mother and a calf. It's almost whispering. It's very quiet. It's very soft. She doesn't presumably wish to draw attention to the her baby who is vulnerable to things like very large sharks and killer whales. But in fact, she, so her, her, very, her communications with the baby are quiet. And we're very interested in those in sperm whales and we're hoping to learn more about them. Then also, if you look at things like uh, humpback whales, their sounds are among the loudest sounds that are made on blue whales. There's the classic example, largest animal that ever lived. And their sounds I showed years and years ago, I calculated years ago, are able to go completely across oceans. And when I brought that information up and made that suggestion, it almost, but not quite, destroyed my career completely because everybody thought, oh my God, Payne's lost all his marbles at this point. And what the idea was is, no, no, these sounds can't possibly go that far. And then I gave a talk at one point to a bunch of acousticians who work for the Navy and are, and for oil companies who are experts on sonar, and the talk was supposed to last an hour. It went on for five hours, and it was them questioning me about every detail of it. And in the end, they concluded, well, Payne, you're underestimating how far whales can hear each other. They're probably doing better than you're giving them claim for. And the well, exciting what's idea... What's the main example of the, the distances and the, the decibels and you know some of those important factors? Well, here's the, you have to look at it historically, because these days the distance is 
not as nearly as great as it once was. But these days, uh, in recent years, Chris Clark, who is somebody who worked with us originally on right, uh, right whales in Argentina, has gone on to do spectacular work. He's miles beyond me. And he has been able, working with the military sonars, which he gets access to, he has been able to show that he could track a single blue whale all over the North Atlantic when at times it's uh, the whale was over a thousand kilometers from one of the hydrophones that he was using. No problem at all. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. And if you go back before the noise of the, uh, the oceans rather became completely polluted with ocean noise, what you find is that at that time, there was no noise at all from ships. And there was no noise at all from ships. And the sounds were, the whale sounds could communicate, could, could go completely across oceans. And in fact, farther as long as you talk about a deep water path. But this kind of long, long communication only takes place in deep water because it involves refraction of sound that depends upon the depth of the water. And when you look at that calculation, you just, the, the one I claimed, and which later on the acousticians from the Navy said was too modest, that claims that you can go 13,000 miles. And that then you look at the question, oh, my God, if you're talking about a deep water path, how many deep water paths are there that are longer than 13,000 miles? And the interesting result of that work is there are none. In other words, 13,000 miles is the limit of deep water paths. One is tempted thereby to conclude that, oh, I see, there was no selective pressure to select for 13,000 miles. And so, in fact, there's no ability to do so. But I think that may be too friendly. Uh, We may be you know, jumping too many barriers by saying that. How quiet was the ocean? I mean, what's what's the metric? The background decibel noise in terms of decibels, like how quiet was the ocean? How noisy is it now? And what are the main contributors to noise? The main contributors to noise in the ocean are at frequencies at which whales, uh, like finbacks and blue whales, the ones that make the loudest, lowest, and most distant traveling sounds, the, the noise levels there are they have a peculiar characteristic. They're caused mostly by wind above the very, very lowest frequencies. And the wind is, in fact, if you're, li- if you're in an area which is quiet and you're not being disturbed by wind, you'll do a hell of a lot better in being able to get a signal, to detect a signal in noise than if you are in a no- with a storm going on or even a strong wind that's blowing around you. And the difference is somewhere between 20 and, and higher decibels. And that is what is, that used to be now the noise at those same frequencies is ships. And so whales were evolved in an ocean that had zero noise from ships. There was not a single ship that was making any noise to, to, to speak of. And now, of course, everything is ships. And so what we have done is to reduce to ludicrous levels distances, excuse me, the, the distances at which whales can communicate. And that's something that Chris Clark has examined beautifully and shown in in uh, very clear ways. So because of the ambient noise now, uh, how much do you think the furthest whale call can be heard? And what implications is, are there on whale pods around the world? Well, it depends on the species you're talking about. If it's speaking down at the very lowest frequencies and so on, they're probably down to a few tens or hundreds of miles until you start looking at how far they can listen into noise. In other words, how far can they, into noise, can they detect a signal? All of my calculations that show these values assume that the whales, as soon as the sound that the whales got was, you know, the same loudness at the distance it was being listened to as noise that was around the whale, the whale wouldn't be able to hear it into the noise. Well, you and I do very well into the noise and go way down into noise. And presumably whales who are you know, have fantastically well-developed acoustic systems, they can probably do better than we do. But I just ignored that as a possibility. I thought, no, let's just see how far they can hear if they are limited to not being able to hear a sound once it has gotten less loud than the noise around them. Although that's 
as I say, a very unrealistic suggestion. Well, what has been the change in, I don't know if it can be observed, but has anyone seen changes in behavior or distribution or movement patterns of whale pods around the world? Yes, there are all sorts of small observations that are showing that kind of thing. Uh, we've done a few of them. Others have done a few of them. And they, they're, it's all, they're strong and valuable, but you have to, unfortunately, sort of go fairly deep into the acoustics of the whole thing before you can feel comfortable about it. And it's what, it's one of the things that causes people to, you know, sh- not shy away from it, but just to, to think, oh my God, too complicated. I don't get it. But you realize that civilization as we know it has been dependent entirely for the last 50 to 60 years on the ability to detect correctly the sounds of nuclear submarines. And I mean, you know, out in the open ocean, there's pretty close to a, a, a bulletless, but otherwise total war going on between or was back in the days, in the earlier days of the Soviet and American submarine fleets, all sorts of sc- scurrilous things happening. I don't know a tenth of them, but it, it is so the knowledge of acoustics and the ability to use them on the behalf of navies like the the U.S. Navy and the Russian Navy, it was the Soviet Navy then, are very highly developed. And when you get the opportunity, as I did once, to go on a, a boat and just see how well they can locate all the whales that are swimming around you, making sounds occasionally, it's very impressive. And that's what we're doing with this spring whale project. How come it's um, no one's been able to figure out what the uh, you know the whales the various whales are saying to each other? What is what is it about their communication? Is it a language? Is it does it seem to have any rules of grammar, or does it have certain sounds that are again identifiable and repeatable that build into words? Like what's the structure of it? That's a good question, and it's what we're trying to determine with sperm whales. But the main problem is. You need to know what was going on when the whale made that sound. And that means that you need to be observing it as you listen. And that's an incredibly difficult problem. And that's the problem we have tackled. And that's the one we're working on. And we're working with people who are brilliant at creating the devices that are necessary to do that, both at Harvard and MIT. And the result of that effort is that I think we have a better shot at getting something which can follow along or swim along with a whale and try to keep track of to see it and see what it's doing while it is in fact uh, doing things. Recently, there was a, a device that you could attach to whales called a D-tag that was invented, uh, co-invented by a former student with me uh, and Peter Tyack. And that device has been used with wonderful improving success of learning about what it is that whales are doing while they're making sounds at least we now often know or can deduce uh, swimming paths underwater of these whales and see when they speed up and slow down and when they make turns and when they dive and come up and so on before we had no idea of that but what i think we need is something which will be uh, able to follow along with the whale and watch it and see what it's doing. That's hard. Are there any of the whales that uh, their communication seems to be a lot more than others, or for some reason it just seems to be a little bit less alien and more understandable? Well, the alien or understandable, they're all alien and very un- ununderstandable. But one of the chatterboxes amongst the whales seems to be uh, the you know the beluga whales and in fact they used to be called by the old whalers sea canaries because in fact they made sounds that are audible they didn't make ultrasonic sounds the way most dolphins do but they made sounds which were actually in the range that people could hear them and when these the old wooden whaling ships were going around of course they didn't have any motors they didn't have a motor to drive them or a generator and the result was but they were very quiet and you could hear these sounds right through the hull of the boat and uh, it gave people the jitters. And and I think they also, we have pretty good evidence that they were listening to humpback whales at times through boats and that that was just terrifying. them. And you can imagine, I've always thought that, you know, the wonderful tale of 
uh, the return when Ulysses is returning from the Battle of Troy and he goes between Scylla and Charybdis and Aeis, they're they're listening at that point to mysterious songs that are coming from the the these mysterious maidens who kill men and attract their attention. And he has himself tied to the mast and his ears and the ears of all the sailors are stopped with wax, but not his. My suspicion is that what is that comes from something. Homer's Odyssey came from some sort of source. And my guess is that they were maybe hearing humpback whales in the Mediterranean. And you look at the records of humpback whales. Are there any humpback whales ever going into the Mediterranean? And the answer we now know is, oh, yes, there were. And um, probably still are occasionally and in some places maybe each year. But it's... uh, What's exciting about those records is that, you know, here you are in a boat, a wooden boat, and it's a small boat, the the boat that Odysseus was returning from Troy, supposedly, in. And this, when you're in a small wooden boat and you're listening to sounds that are being played in the, are being made in the water, you're actually hearing them sounds coming at you from all sides of your body at once. In other words, from every surface of the boat, you're inside the boat. And that is an experience that you have never had and I have never had. And when you do hear it, I have had it, listen to it in, in, intentionally. It's totally mysterious. What your brain does is to decide uh, that it's actually coming at you from all directions at once. When it's coming at you from all directions at once, it decides that it's coming from inside your head. So it is a very mysterious, goofy sound of, kind of sound. Well, if you can't make up a good story out of that, of something like Scylla's and Charybdis, then you know you should be doing something other than writing, it seems to me. And Mm. I think that that's, my guess is that that may very well be the origin of that particular story in the Odyssey. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That makes sense. Well, very good. Um, So what what lies ahead for the future of understanding and working with whales? What what projects are you working on or um, keeping tabs on? Well, the main thing that we're, that I'm involved with now is this so-called CETI uh, project that I was mentioning before. There is a, a, a very interesting approach that I, we are trying to take, and we've actually written a paper about our plans for the future. And that interesting approach is based upon some recent work which took two languages, which were give enormous samples of these two languages were given to a computer. And then through machine learning, the computer was supposed to discover anything it could about them. And it had no instructions whatsoever as to what was going on. It just looked, started looking through data and looking for things that were similar in these two sets of data. And eventually, it and it did so in over 100 dimensions. I can't remember the number of dimensions. Anyway, uh, so every sound was characterized as to how long it lasted, when it started, when it stopped, what other sounds occurred before it, you know, how loud it was, how high in frequency it went, how low, how, if it was made of pulses, how many pulses, and so forth, just on and on and on, all sorts of measurements. And from this entire thing, you could produce a, rec- a, rec- a representation of the results that were obtained, which looks very much like a three-dimensional cloud filled with little tiny arrows. And you look at these arrows and each one of them has a number, which was assigned in this, it was one of the instructions the computer was given. And it was to use an arrow. And this arrow actually is pointing in some direction or other. And you look at arrow number 148, let's say, I'm making up the numbers, they're not the right numbers, I'm sure. And you discover, oh my gosh, uh, that's the, seen seen in the same way and has the same direction and value that you get in sound 643 from the other language. And that means maybe they're the same. So then you compare these arrows to a treatment of English, which you do understand, and you discover, oh my God, that's that's the word for man, let's say. And then you discover in the other language, oh, it's the word for man also. And then you look at the words that are near it, and you discover, oh, there's a word for prince there. And when you find the one that makes is the word for woman, you discover, oh, there's a word for princess there. 
near it. And if you look at these sorts of clusters of arrows, you slowly realize, my God, these two languages that we chose, I think one was Navajo. I don't remember what the other one was. And But languages that almost no one speaks or understands anything of, just a small group of people. Then do this for language after language, pair after pair of those various languages. And what you discover is a fascinating fact, which is that most languages seem to be constructed according to the same sort of semantic rules. And uh, the computer, of course, that does all this work has no clue as to what the words mean. It just knows that, oh, this word is like that word. It's behaving the same way in all these hundred and odd and 40 or whatever it was dimensions that we have. And that is an incredibly powerful technique, I think, and so does good as the group that I'm with as a way of trying to start to get some evidence as to, well, do whales have any kind of what I will now call language? I normally refer to whale speak because so many of my colleagues are utterly threatened by having the word language applied to anything but a human being. But is there a language, no matter how simple it might be, that it exists that has, in, in fact, laws that are somewhat at least similar to the laws of that you get from in, in human languages. Has that been observed when that's looking at whales, whale song yeah. or no? So that's what we're doing. That, that's what CD is up to in part. It's one of our approaches, mm. but it's a powerful approach, I believe. And I think it's going to have some very interesting results in the future. And it's the trouble with that sort of approach is that the easiest way to do it involves having massive samples of language and nobody has those we don't either i i my institute ocean alliance took a trip around the world and it's it's vessel the odyssey which lasted for five and a half years and we got samples from uh 954 or something like that sperm whales all over the world in every ocean and these samples of these were samples of flesh and they showed and but, but at the same time we were recording samples of sound from each group that we we discovered or, or came to and these groups were making sounds that are uh, that were obviously somewhat different in sort of clusters well that kind of work we gave some of that data to Hal Whitehead who does beautiful work on, on the culture of whales and he's done wonderful stuff with that and it, and then one of his chief students is working, is going to be doing the whale research that we're doing with the CD program. And uh, that's uh, Sean Giro is his name. And that is, and that will come from looking at the sort of samples we get. But there are other tricks you can play when you don't have an absolutely enormous sample of sounds, which get you to the same rough idea of what sort of the sem- uh, semantics, if any, are present in a, you know, a, a kind of communication that these animals have, what I call whale speak, in order to avoid calling it whale language. Okay. Has anyone tried to give a name to any of these uh, languages, like whalish, humpbackish? No, no, you need to make one up for us, actually, Richard. It, it would be, it, nobody's come up with a good one. There, I've heard some ones that aren't good. I won't repeat them, but there we are. Yeah. Well, very good. Roger, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and the work of SETI? Where can they go? Well, the work of SETI is on our website. It's Project SETI. It's dot org. Yes, that's the one. Project SETI dot org. Sorry. It's SETI uh, C-E-T-I or how's it yes, spelled? For, yes, for Cetacean Translation Initiative. Very good. Yeah, well, Roger, thank you for coming. It's rare that I get to speak to someone about this, but uh, it's very cool what you've been doing. And I uh, you know, hope you continue and, and crack the code and we can uh, understand whales at some point, you know? Well, it, it, I think it would have a huge effect on the, the, you know, the sort of the feeling that humanity has with the rest of life. I feel the single mm-hmm. most important that every thing that everyone must do in, in, in their lives is to basically focus all of our attention, all of our effort, all of everything that we do, whether you're talking about writing or reading or creating something or, or, you know, arguing about it or anything that we do has to look closely at 
what is the real problem that faces life, which is that we are destroying it and doing so so fast that in a very few years it will, you know, then we, it, those very species that support us will be gone. And when that happens, we have no future. And I don't mean just, you know, well, we kind of have no future. I mean, no future as in none, you know, lights out, game over. It's, this is the most serious problem humanity has ever faced. It is completely underestimated by almost every force that has any control. It's starting to be looked at more carefully. The public catches on to it so much faster than does the, than do the world leaders. I mean, there is an argument going on at this very moment in Congress about, you know, well, Biden's, it's this very expensive program that he's got, which would help us get closer to a kind of world where we've had attention to enough to stop the use of the sort of things that are actually destroying our chances on earth oh no that's treated like sort of any other political football and being mm. kicked around and being and the republicans are very expert in stopping that kind of progress and that will be someday identifiable i think is the biggest mistake we humans ever made we've made a lot but that will be numero uno as they say well very good well thank you for coming if you like this podcast please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.